the latest in the series of Rotman Institute lectures. Uh, before we started, at the start, I would like to advertise the exciting event that's coming up next week. The an this year's annual Nuremberg lecture will be given by Leo Kadnoff, who you see there. It is next Tuesday at um, Tuesday, 7.30 p.m., Somerville House, 3345. Um, that will be a lecture intended for the general public, so if you're not a special physicist or a philosopher, feel free to go. Um, then, subsequently, the same week, we've got Leo all week. Uh, Wednesday, he's going to be talking for the um, Applied Math Department on the good, the bad, and the awful. Scientific simulation and prediction. So that's Wednesday, 2:30 2 at Middlesex College 204. And then finally, um, Friday, a talk for the philosophy department: Slippy waves, brilliant springs, blind, blind spots. And that's going to be in Stevenson Hall, 11:45 at 2 p.m. <coughs>
Okay, so let me now turn to my talk. You've, you've seen the title, Approximation and, uh, um, and Idealization and Why the Difference Matters. Uh, let me uh, go through the three things that I'm going to be doing. Uh, this is a summary of the, uh, of the talk. Uh, the first thing I'm, I'm going to do is a question of nomenclature. I'm going to be talking about approximations and idealizations. Uh, my experience of reading the literature is that these terms are used differently by different people. And that makes it very hard to say clear things. So I'm simply going to declare particular uses for the terms. The, these are just stipulations. I, I don't mind if you don't like them, uh, but I am going to suggest that the things that they're designating are important and must be kept separate. Right? In fact, the fact of the separation is the key point of, of the whole talk. So I'm going to use these terms in a very particular way. Um, um, I'd be happy if you do the same as well. It will enable us to communicate uh, more, more efficiently. Uh, so the term approximation I'm going to use for inexact descriptions. I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. And idealizations will uh, designate novel systems whose properties provide those inexact descriptions. Right, that's the first thing. Now, why, why bother to introduce uh, um, uh, a precise uh, notation? Well, the, uh, the reason is it can do some work for us. And the work that it's going to do is the following. I'm interested in what happens when we generate uh, idealizations by taking limits to infinity of various quantities. The particular case that I have in mind is what happens in statistical physics, where we uh, take the limit of the uh, number of components in our system uh, uh, towards infinity. And the major burden of my talk is to argue that the taking of that limit is an especially difficult and fraught process. Uh, we've known for a while that there are problems in taking the limit. You need to be careful. I'm going to suggest you need to be even more careful than we thought before. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, one of the main conclusions will be the following. Things that we routinely talk of as infinite idealizations are uh, often only what I call approximations and actually do not uh, involve necessarily infinite systems of, of, um, of components. So that's, the, that's the main message, and I'll be making good on that as best I can. And then finally, I want to introduce some new material that I've uh, not really talked about too much before. Uh, it's been frustrating to watch the literature on... Um, on uh, statistical physics and, and, and thermodynamics, uh, there's a debate over whether there's reduction or emergence truly happening, and there are two sides, each of which seems to be perfectly able and perfectly competent. No, no, the back, the battery's fine. Um, <laughs> no, I'm clear. Um, no, it's not again. It must be, it must be a loose connection. Do you, do you need it for your equipment? Um, I, I think, can you hear me at the back? I can. Yeah. What, do you, what do you think? I, I don't want to. Should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If that works for you, I yeah. I, 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 I don't care. I'm not used to these being wired other than through drinking too much coffee. Um, okay. So there've been there've been debates, and both sides of the debate are you know they fully understand all of the issues, and it seems impossible that there could be a debate, right? Because everyone understands fully what's going on, yet they disagree. Uh, what I'm going to suggest is that there's been a um, an unnoticed difference in terminology, and it's to do with the notion of levels that are being employed. And there's one reading of levels which makes one side come out looking right, and there's another reading of levels that makes the other side come out uh, uh, looking correct. And I, I, I don't think I don't think there's a, a correct answer to which is the right way to go. They're just different senses. And when you see that, it sort of relieves a lot of the tension. We can relax a bit for one hour. Okay, so uh, let, me then, uh, let me then move on and get on with the, the, the first item of business, and that is characterizing approximation and uh, idealization. So uh, I'll work through a very simple case just to, to give you a basic <laughs> idea. Uh, this is a pot of skew that's boiling up there. I don't know if the image is coming through well enough. The question is, how hot is that pot? 
That's, that's the question. We know that skew boils somewhere around 100 degrees Celsius, right? So that's, the, that's an inexact description. Uh, if you, you know that once you add stuff to water, its boiling point changes. To, even just putting a bit of salt in is enough to change the boiling point of water. So we have that as an inexact description of the, of the pump temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. Um, that turns out to be an exact truth for a pot of pure water boiling at standard pressure. Right? And so you have the two elements there that I'm interested in. The first element is a proposition, which is an inexact description, and the second element is another system. Right? And I want to use the terminology of approximation for the first guy, that inexact description. Exactly 100 degrees, right? Not exactly correct. Roughly correct. And I want to use this other system here. I'm going to call that the idealization. The the inexact description that we're using here is actually an exact description of the properties of the idealized system. That's the, the basic structure that, I, that I'm going to be working with. Now, how do these things interact when we start to uh, employ them? Oh, oh and, I, and I should mention here, I haven't included the notion of model in this, but if you want to uh, find a place for the term model, um, there's an easy way to do it. You just look at these idealizing systems here, and insofar as they have further properties uh, um, uh, that are disanalogous to the properties of the target system of interest, then you're moving towards being more like a model. And that, there's a place I have uh, in the system. You can talk that way if you wanted to. I haven't employed that, but I'll, I'll just mention it. OK, so how does this work? Let's take a case where everything works out beautifully. This is a this is um, someone who's just given an unsuccessful talk at the Unicorn. Um, this is a, someone jumping out of an airplane, a skydiver. You know what's going to happen in the long run. The skydiver is uh, going to approach a terminal velocity of uh, g divided by k. But in the first few moments of fall, I don't know, power series expansion on the formula, in the first few moments of fall, the, uh, the velocity, the downward speed, I should say, of the um, uh, of the, the skydiver uh, is going to be roughly given by this formula. Uh, the speed is going to uh, in, increase uh, in proportion to the uh, uh, to time. Okay, that is an inexact description of the first moments of fall. If we wanted to employ an idealization, how could we do it? Well, we're allowed to use fictitious systems here, and here's a fictitious system that works. Right? That's a bell jar in which we have pumped out all the air, so this is the skydiver falling in a vacuum, and when the skydiver falls in a vacuum, the exact description is that uh, V is equal to, to, uh, to, to GT, okay? So you can now see that this inexact uh, description uh, is an exact description of the idealizing system. It functions as an approximation for the, for the, uh, the real system, which is a target system. Pretty straightforward. So you're thinking, well, how can this ever fail? Well, let me show you an example where things come unstuck. Uh, we know that bacteria grow uh, with generations roughly following an exponential formula. So here's what the data might look like. That's a little colony of bacteria there. Here's what the data might look like. As the generations pass with T, the number N is increasing by a curve uh, that is, well, sort of exponential. It can't be exactly exponential because almost all of the values of that exponential function there are going to be uh, irrational numbers. Right? And uh, so the ends aren't going to work out to be whole numbers, but colonies of bacteria have got whole numbers of bacteria. Right? So it's got, it's got to be an approximation. Right? So, so far, so good. We have a proposition that approximates. And it approximates better the larger the number of, of bacteria you have in the colony. So you want to say, naively, naively, you would just say, so we're going to take the limit to infinity, and then everything's going to be fine. Well, in one sense, it's going to be fine, but in another sense, it's not going to be fine. Because if you take a literal system, a literal infinity here, right, let n literally go to infinity, you now have numbers that you try and plug into the formula that don't make any sense. Right? You've got an, in, an in, infinite number on the left is equal to an infinite number on the right multiplied by exponential kt. The, the, whole, the, the whole things become degenerate now. So you, you, don't really, uh, you don't really have the sort of infinite system you thought you had. Now, there are ways around this, and I'm not going to go into the details here, but you can see the basic difficulty that I'm going to be struggling with all the way through here. It looked like everything was going to be fine, 
and then suddenly you discover that infinite system doesn't have the properties that you form. It's not possible to use that exponential formula on the totality of the system to describe how, um, um, how its size is growing over time. You've got, to, you've got to use other tricks. Okay. So let's, let's move on. The system uh, then, in the language that I'm using here, it provides an approximation uh, that the limit fails to deliver an idealization because there is no system that has exactly the properties that, that, we, that we want there. All right, so now, now let's look more carefully at this issue. And I want to think in terms of using these limits to form idealizations. And I'll be narrowing in now on statistical physics, where the number n is typically the number of components, the number of molecules that might be in a system. So how can they be used? Um, we're seeing two ways now. One of the ways is by an idealization. You form a limit system with infinitely many components and look at its properties and use them as an approximate description of the system of interest to you. Or the other way of doing it is just to look at what happens as your system gets larger and larger and larger. Uh, you look at the way the properties behave as the system gets larger and larger and larger. Those properties are going to stabilize out to some limiting values. But at no point are you actually considering an infinite system. You're considering systems that have 10, 100, 1,000, a million, and so on, and so on, and so on. But you only ever consider finite numbers all the way up, right? That's the, that's the idea. And then, and then you get the, the, the approximation. Now, these are, these are really are two very different techniques. Uh, and, they, and they carry some dangers. Um, cool. So there should be something in the box, and I don't remember what that was. There's some, there's some glitch in the PowerPoint. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a danger here with the idealization, that if you naively assume that taking the limit is going to return you a system with all the properties that you want, you're going to get into trouble. The infinite system just might not have those properties. Right? So you have to be careful, because an infinite system's properties can come apart, and those are very large systems. Uh, with the approximation, you're safer um, uh, because you've never actually gotten into the difficulty of, of, of the behavior of the literally infinite system. All right, so let, let me try and give an illustration of, of, of then how things can come unstuck. There's the red hand that says, watch out, danger. Right? Um, and so, so here's a very simple system. I think one of the simplest you can see easily. We have a system, and I've labeled its states n1, n2, n3, n4. We're interested in taking the limit of that system as n goes to infinity. And what is the system? The system is just a line, right? It's, it's got a right angle bend in it, very simple geometric system. It's, it's, it's unit length on one side, unit length on the, on the other side. What's the NS2 system? To get to the NS2 system, I take that line and I fold down the point. Right? So the length of the line stays the same, but I now have two points at the top. And what's the NS3 system? I take the two points and I fold them down. So now I get a zigzaggy line. And the length of that line is the same, right? Because I've not changed any lengths. I've just, I've just, uh, I've just redistributed where the lines were. And I do that indefinitely until I get to the n is equal to, to infinity. Okay. So that, that's the sequence of, of um, systems that interest me. Now we have properties, and the, the, the property is just the length of the line. And that property is very well behaved. The length of the n is one line is uh, is two. The length of the n is Two line is two, the length of n is three line is three, and so it's two, 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 two. What is the limit? All right, well, the limit is two. Right? That's the easiest limit you can possibly take if nothing, uh, if nothing changes. So you have a limiting property. So the thing at the top is the limit property, the thing underneath is the, uh, is the limit system. Now, when everything's going well here, what's going to happen is that these two guys are going to match up the limit property and the limit system are going to agree. And then taking this infinite limit is going to be uh, a very nice way of producing approximations. Your idealization works, it, its properties deliver an approximation. That is, if your interest in this case is not the behavior of the inf of the this infinity system, right? you're interested in the behavior of uh, these lines when you have very large n. You know, I'm getting that. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. <laughs> You're getting ahead of them. Yeah. I, I, I knew you'd come. Um, remember, our interest is not the infinite case. We're looking with our interest in, in statistical physics is not what happens when you have 
an infinity of molecules of air in the room because there's no room that has an infinity of molecules. We just want a very large number. So I'm interested in this system when n is very, very large and how that, and how that might work. Okay, so that's, that's the way things work when everything works out well. But of course, the difficulty, as some of my brother colleagues here have <laughs> noticed, is that that isn't what happened. Right? Uh, the difficulty here is that the limit property and the limit system can come apart. And that's what's happened. The n is infinity limit state is actually the hypotenuse of this triangle over, over here that I started with. And it has the value of the square root of 2. So you've got the classic case of where the limiting system and the limit property diverge. And they do it at the very last moment. It doesn't matter how big you make that n, right? Everything is going to match up perfectly. But when you go to the actual uh, limit at infinity, the, the, the guys come apart and they, and they separate. So that, those are what, that's the first of the two ways that I've indicated in which the limit property and the limit system uh, can come apart, they might just disagree. Right? Now, there's a second way in which this can happen as well. There can be a problem. And the second way is there just might be no limit. Uh, you know the taking of limits is always four. You can take a limit and, and, or, or undertake a limiting procedure and then discover that the limit does not exist. And it's entirely possible, numerous examples, where you can have cases of the <coughs> limit of the system not existing. There is no limit system, but there is a limit to the properties. Um, I'll mention other examples just, just briefly. Those of you who, who read the paper that's been circulated will have seen the examples of the capsule of the ellipsoid and the sphere. Right? They, they uh, implement this. Um, the infinite sphere is an example where there, where there is no limit system. You know, people like to talk about infinite spheres, but in Euclidean space, uh, an infinite sphere has no referent. There is no, nothing. You know, um, show me the locus of all points that are infinitely far, uniquely distant from some central point. You know, that's, there aren't any such guys. Uh, the bacterium example was another case where there is no limit system, but the limit property certainly exists. Okay, so let's now move on. I now want to have a look at how the, these issues work out uh, when you start playing around with statistical physics. Uh, so I want to look at the case of what's known as the continuum limit. This one is not much talked about because it has problems, but it has, it has its uses. It's interesting for us because it's easy to see what's going on in the case of the continuous limit. Uh, what we want to do is take up. Uh, the thing in the box should be an infinity. That's it. So every time you see a box, right, um, this is Pittsburgh talk for infinity. So what we're going to do uh, to get this continuum limit is we're going to take the number of, you know, this is a, this, this, the, 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 the beer box is on the right, uh, containing something like a gas or some sort of system. Uh, these represent the individual components, typically you know, molecules. Uh, and what we're interested in doing uh, is considering what happens when the n uh, becomes arbitrarily large, taking the limit to infinity. And we're going to take that limit in such a way that the volume occupied uh, by, the, uh, um, uh, by the system remains fixed. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is useful if you are dealing with spatially inhomogeneous systems. If, for example, you have a you know, a, a sphere of some fluid with a vapor above it. You don't want to make the whole system infinitely big because you'll lose the, the gas-liquid interface. You know, the, 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 the so so that, that's a case where this might be interesting to you. Now, we need to specify a little bit more carefully exactly how this limit is taken, or we have a different one. This particular one is taken so that n, the number of components multiplied by um, the cube of the component size remains constant. You can have other rules, but this is the particular one that's, that's used here. It, um, the properties of this limit are that they obliterate fluctuations. What happens is the Boltzmann's constant ends up going to zero. Avogadro's number blows up, but that's, that's just one of the, the properties of the limit. Okay, so uh, that, that doesn't concern me. What concerns me is how does our idealization procedure look when we're playing around with this guy? Well, this is a case where there is no limit state. Right? It looks as though, right? it looks as though as you proceed with n growing arbitrarily large, that the state of the gas is approaching some well-defined state when you have infinitely many um, gas molecules there. But that's an illusion, as I'll argue on the next slide. Um, there is no such limit state. There's no properly defined uh, limit for, 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 for that guy. Uh, let me ask you to bracket that for a moment while I 
for all the uh, main conclusion that interests here, interest is here. And that is, um, this is a case of the failure of idealization. There is no idealization in the sense that we can generate an idealizing system by the means of this, of this limit operation that carries the properties that we want. However, the properties that we're interested in do indeed converge and do return the results that we want. So we're interested in things like the density. Right? And the density of the fluid is going to, is going to stabilize out to whatever the value is that, that's appropriate here. So, so we can have limit properties, but actually have no limit system. Right? So you have in my language an approximation but not, not an idealization. Okay, so uh, why is it that that limit doesn't exist? Well, let me give you an analogy that I think you'll see captures the essential point. Uh, when we print either newspapers or nowadays with that laser printers, uh, we actually can't print a gray, uh, just using a regular black and white printer. The way you get gray is by printing lots of little dots. 50-50 right? dots, 50-50 black and white on some screen is going to give you a 50% gray. So you might imagine that we could achieve that 50% gray by simply following the, this procedure. I started out with a square, and I have divided it into four uh, quadrants. And each quadrant is, is, is colored the way you can see, half a black, half a white. We're then saying, well, that's not really there. Let's now continue the procedure. Each quadrant gets divided in the same way. So we had four in the first stage, we have 16 in the next stage, and then a whole bunch more in the next stage. And we keep dividing smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and we let in the number of, of stages that we consider go to infinity. Now, what you're thinking is something like this, if you don't, don't focus too much on you're saying, well, so what's going to happen is that in the limit, I'm getting 50% gray. I'm getting a nice, homogeneous 50% gray. What else, what else could it be? But no, that is not what happens. Right? Uh, what happens is there is no limit. The limit is not well defined. Now, the way to see that is to pick a point, any point that you like, and I pick one there, that's the, that's the, that's the black ball, and ask, what is the color at that point? At every stage of the process, the color has to be either black or white. There is no finite stage of the process when it's anything other than black or white. So there's no way the limit is going to turn that into the 50% gray. And to be more precise, just so you get a sense that it's, you know, that, that it's a, looking like a traditional failure to, to converge, um, if you take the particular point, two-fifths and one-third, you take those as the uh, as the axes, and you plot the colors that are present, uh, you get you get what I've shown in the graph here. You get white, white, black, black, white, white, black, black, white, white, black, black, and it's just this it's just this classical um, alternating sequence that has no that has no limit. You never there, there is no gray. It could never provide a gray. That's not the thing that you want. Now, of course, lots of other quantities are well defined. You can ask what is the average amount of color in any area, no matter how small you pick the area, and in the limit, that is going to be defined, and it's going to give you the 50% that you want. So the properties have a nice limit, as I said earlier on, but, the, uh, um, but, the, but there is no limit system itself. Right? And I hope you see the analogy to what's happening earlier on, the, the black and the white just correspond to parts of space that are occupied by the molecules and parts of space that are Oh, it gets more complicated because now we have to, we have we have all those different parts moving around. But you know that's a technicality that we can deal with. If you if you if you if you want to figure out ways of doing it, yeah, you know, cool the system down to absolute zero so nothing moves. Like that, you know. but, but always, okay. So let's now move on to uh, a more difficult case. It's more complicated. Uh, this is the limit that is more commonly used now in statistical physics. This is known as the thermodynamic uh, limit. Uh, and it is uh, used as an idealization with, with mixed success. That's the, the point I want to make. This is, what it, uh, this is the way the, the limit is defined. You let the number uh, of, um, of components go to a little box, which you remember means infinity. We remember that? OK, good. And you, get, uh, and you let the volume also go to me. To, uh, to infinity in such a way that the ratio, that is the, that is the density, uh, stays constant. Right? So, the, so the system gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the, that's the trick, and of course, in the, in the limit, you, uh, uh, you, you're going to have an infinite system. 
you now know, of course, there are two ways of thinking about that limit, either as an idealization in the way that I described it, or as an approximation. And when you look in the liturgy, you'll find both ways of, of thinking about it. I've called these the strong and the weak. So this is the strong sense of the, uh, um, of the thermodynamic limit. And here it is described by Ruel in the book of 2004. Uh, the physical systems to which the thermodynamic formalism applies are idealized to be actually infinite. This idealization is necessary because only infinite systems exhibit sharp phase transitions. Much of the thermodynamic formalism is concerned with the study of states of infinite systems. Right, that's a very clear statement of the sort of idealization that, I, that I've been talking about. There are other texts that do it differently. Uh, there's one, uh, the Babak et al. from 2004. And they, they very clearly take what I'm calling the weak limit. They consider only the behavior of the properties as the number of components goes to infinity. And, and, uh, and they never actually make assertions about, about system that, that consist of an actual infinity of uh, uh, of, of, of the particles. Okay, so you're saying, well, what's, what's the problem with this? Well, the problem is that when you study the state of, of an actual infinity of, of components that can interact, you get a qualitative change in the behavior. Right? Um, uh, make the system very, very large, no matter how large. As long as there are finitely many components, you get one behavior. The moment you make the transition to an infinite number of components, you get a discontinuity in the behavior. And let me let me describe that discontinuity for you. This is one of the simplest systems that you consider here. This is an infinite one-dimensional crystal, which I'm idealizing, which I'm representing uh, in the uh, uh, in the traditional way. It's mass spring, mass spring, mass spring. All masses are the same, and the spring is simply a great book store. It's a, it's, a, it's a very simple system. If you have a finite one-dimensional crystal of that type, it does everything that you would expect, something unusual. But if you have an infinite crystal like that, it has the following awkward property. And the awkward property is that it can spontaneously excite itself and set itself into motion. Right? So, um, You've got to sort of see the derivation of how that works, but, but I can give you the intuitive idea. The intuitive idea goes something like this. We're going to start out with a system that's quiescent, and then something will happen, and then then something, and something, and something, and something, and we'll gradually move down. Let me go down to the end and work backwards to see how it works. So at a later stage, we're going to find that this mass here is going to be set into motion because a little bit earlier, that one started moving. Right. Now, why did that one start moving? Well, just a little bit earlier, the next one over started moving just a little bit faster. And why did that one start moving? Well, because a little bit earlier, the one next to it started moving. Why did that one start moving? Because, you know, and so on. Now, if this were a, if this were a finite crystal, um, this, this story would rapidly come to an end. We'd, we'd get to the, to the end of the chain, and the only reason that one of the mass at the end is moving is because someone's giving it a nudge. But when you go to an infinite system, there is no end to that chain. And it's a simple matter of mathematics to realize that you can compress all of these motions into a finite time. So this infinite sequence of, uh, of actions can be completed in a finite time. I'll just put in the rest of, of, the, of, of the stuff there. And so what you actually see is a propagation, a spontaneous excitation propagating in from infinity, as it were, setting the whole guy uh, in, into motion. So you can see this has got properties. This, this crystal has got properties that you don't see in ordinary uh, uh, finite systems, no matter how big you, uh, you make them. Uh, and the, you know, the properties are maximally bad if you're interested in statistical physics. Uh, you know, determinism and energy cons uh, conservation fail. And that, that, that is a complete breakdown of the standard formalism that's used in statistical physics. Uh, if, if determinism is gone, you've, you've lost the flow in Hamiltonian space. Uh, energy conservation is gone. The Hamiltonian's now um, not doing what you thought it was doing, and, and, and so on. And I'll just mention that this indeterminism is generic in infinite systems. Right? You, have to, you have to do that. Okay, so, so how, do we, how do we deal with it? Well, um, there are really two traditions for working with this. Uh, one tradition comes out of the mathematicians who have who started working with Cyril, being one of them, uh, Langford uh, uh, being another, and uh, they deal with it quite explicitly. It's, it, it's in the system. They were some of the 
play with people who first discovered these effects. Blanford was one of the earliest writers on, the, uh, on this spontaneous um, um, excitation of, uh, of, of, of persistence. So here's a, here's a, a way that is dealt with. This is a paper uh, that talks about one dimensional systems of infinite particles. It's a very simple system like that one dimensional crystal. Uh, what Blanford does is he explicitly introduces a clause here, an extra clause into his theorem, uh, which bars the monsters. Remember, uh, Lakatos talked about monster barring. You have to add in a clause that you don't need when you work with finitely. This clause says you're not allowed to, 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 <coughs> to have um, deflections of the masses that are, that are arbitrary and large. It's a bound. Okay. So now this is the way this is the way that it's described. Uh, we emphasize that we are not considering the theory of infinite systems for its own sake uh, uh, so much as for the fact that this is the only precise way of removing inessential complications due to boundary effects. Uh, I just want to raise a flag here and say, no, this is an extremely dangerous procedure. I understand, I don't doubt the theorem is correct. But look at, look at what's being done here. You're acknowledging that the infinite system has a qualitatively different behavior from the finite system. You've identified one of those behaviors. You add an extra clause to, to block that one behavior. How do you know that all the other behaviors are going to be what you expect? Right? I mean, to know that, you would actually have to know already what the finite systems are behaving like. So this is, you know, I, I understand this mathematically appealing to do this. But it's a dangerous procedure to follow because you, you don't know what other clauses you might have to throw in there. Okay, so I've, I've gone through one example here. Um, I have more material that I can go through on examples like that, but I, I won't talk about them. I'll just mention to you that there's another limit that looks rather like the thermodynamic limit known as the Boltzmann Grad limit. It has the same problem. And that is that when you, if you consider a literally infinite system, Right? Uh, then, you, uh, then you get uh, indeterminism suddenly arising. But the indeterminism comes about through a different mechanism. So if you're thinking that particular mechanism is hokey, there's a different reason for why the uh, Boltzmann bread uh, 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 limit produces indeterminism. And, it, and, and the, the basic mechanism is that, that all molecules have collapsed down to points. And you can no longer resolve collisions when you're uh, uh, univocally, when you're dealing with, uh, uh, with, with your points. But, uh, Okay, so let's continue on. Let me talk a bit now about the normalization group methods. Um, big, technical, complicated, wretched thing to work through with utterly extraordinary and amazing and wonderful results. So I don't want to try and, and, and give you a tutorial on them. I'm just going to speak to those of you who already know some of this stuff. There's just one point that matters. Right? One point that matters in all of these derivations. Uh, I'll mention for those of you who haven't come across this before, though in this room I'm expecting that's rather unlikely. Um, the wonderful thing about renormalization group methods is that, give, that it gives us this, um, this beautiful access to the behavior of thermal systems near their critical points. In particular, um, uh, you, you can determine certain properties uh, as a function of the reduced temperature defined there on the left. Uh, the dependence turns out to be related to uh, certain exponential coefficients, and these coefficients belong to certain universality classes, and you've got all the beautiful stuff that Leo Kadmoff is going to tell you about next week, because you do so much, so much better than I do. Okay. What I want to look at is the, is the method that's used, because, this, because you know, the basis of the method is not so often talked about, but it needs to be talked about as a key thing. The basis of the renormalization uh, group method is to generate a transformation. And the transformation is based on a physical assumption. You start out with a system, I'm trying to draw n components. There are actually only 16 there, but I, I, I mean n to be very much bigger than that. Right? Um, and, you make it, and there's a physical postulate, and that is that the thermal properties of the system are to some degree independent of the internal degrees of freedom. It's possible to mask out certain internal degrees of freedom without changing the thermodynamic properties. Right? That's simply, that's positive. It seems to work very well. It's, it's not completely obvious to me that it should be true, but I have no doubt of it because the methods are working so beautifully well. Uh, one of the ways you mask them out is the following. You take that system of n components and you cluster them into little groups, little clusters of components. So I've, I've formed clusters of four here. 
And what you then end up with by supposition, by physical supposition, is that the two systems have the same thermal properties. Now, what is it to have the same thermal properties? In the framework of statistical mechanics, you have the same thermal properties if the partition functions are the same. Z is the partition function, or is it Z? It's here. It's here. It's here. Yeah, I grew up with Z, too. That's a good back home. Right, so, 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 um, so Z prime of the, is the transform partition function of N prime, the, the new number of components is equal to Z of N, right? And, and that's the key assumption. It says the thermal properties are the same, right? And as you know from the, uh, from, uh, the partition function, you can generate the normal uh, thermal properties by, uh, by simple operations, sometimes differential operations. So, for example, the total free energy is minus kT times the logarithm of, of Z. And so if the two Zs are the same, then the two free energies are the same. Uh, what about the free energies per component? Well, you've got N prime components in one case and N, and N components in the other. So you get the transformation all coming up automatically. So that's basically how, how it works. That's where the transformation comes from. I've gone through all of that to emphasize just one point. The point that I want to emphasize is the following. If n is infinite, z is undefined. Right? So if n is infinite, then the transformations become degenerate. It's like the case of the, of the infinite bacteria. Right? And so everything stops at some point. It stops around the middle, and you simply can't go any further. So if you're playing around with your normalization group transformations that proceed stepwise through some space, then you can never actually take a step that will drop you on a point where n is equal to infinity because the, the calculations, the equations are, uh, are, just, are just going to break down. OK, so let's have a look at how those transformations are used. The, uh, the method now turns to a uh, space of reduced Hamiltonians. This space is full of Hamiltonians that are, if I recall correctly, reduced by a factor of, of kT. Right? And then you use the renormalization group to generate a flow over the space of Hamiltonians. Um, I've, drawn in the, uh, uh, I've drawn in the flow here. Uh, you can see there are certain fixed points in the flow, defined in the usual way uh, mathematically. And you look at the, at the flow over the different Hamiltonians in the neighborhood of that fixed point, and by investigating the properties of that flow, uh, you then recover the critical coefficients for the, uh, for the thermodynamic uh, for the thermodynamic properties that, uh, that, that, that we're dealing with. Um, and I'll, I'll just mention that the, the lines corresponding to, um, um, uh, uh, to infinitely many components are the, are the, are the dominant lines. Uh, and they, uh, they do not clearly correspond to any real physical system. They've been added in in order to close a space. Right? You, you, have a, you have an open space, and you, you're, you're, you're simply adding, adding in the boundary. Um, if, you know, if you want to say they correspond to uh, systems with infinitely many components and try to attach a Hamiltonian to them, it's then not obvious that this flow is going to be doing the work that you want, because thermodynamic quantities are only derived by using all the standard results of statistical physics. And they're breaking down. The addition function is not defined there. But it's OK, because the flow never actually touches those. Um, these, are, these are asymptotes that are, uh, that, are, that are never actually visited. So what does this long analysis mean? Well, the long analysis ends up with a very short slogan here. It's working by approximation, not by infinite idealization. I distinguish the two ideas approximation and idealization. This system is not getting its results from an infinite idealization. This system is not doing what we saw earlier on, where you construct a system that contains an actual infinity of components, figure out what its properties are, and then use them as an approximation for the, for the systems with very many components. You just aren't doing that. You're looking at the limiting behavior of the properties of systems with very large but always finite many. That's the, the take home message of this, uh, uh, of this rather uh, long excursion. So you, you can see there are, um, there are some take home models here. Now, Leo Gadoff is going to be here next week, and he's going to uh, be talking. He might say this the existence of a phase transition requires an infinite system. No phase transitions occur in systems with a finite number of degrees of freedom. Um, 
I don't know if you recognize the track when someone set one for you, but you're looking at one. Uh, he knows that that isn't exactly literally true, and he's just waiting. Um, but let me just say the, the obvious stuff about that. What do you get from the infinite system? Um, if you go to the, if you take the infinite limit of the properties, yes, uh, you're going to get the mathematical discontinuity of the, uh, uh, of the mathematical quantities. But the idea that you need an infinite system in order to get phase transitions would be a disaster for modern science if it were true. Because what that would mean is that the phenomenon of phase transition, which happens in ordinary systems, is incompatible with those systems consisting of finite and many components. In other words, if you need infinitely many molecules to have ice melt in a cup of water, right, then you have refuted the atomic theory of matter, which is based fundamentally on the idea that there are finitely many molecules in the cup. And I know the others. So, so, so what do we do? What do we do? What do we think about this? Um, I think I think that the clear idea this is what Lanford uh, said earlier. We emphasize that we are not considering the theory of infinite systems for its own sake. We regard infinite systems as approximations to large finite systems rather than the reverse. I want to be a little bit stronger than that, and I want to say um, what is controlling this entire uh, analysis of the properties of finite systems. All this talk about infinite systems is dangerous and distracting, but be careful, be sure you know exactly what you're saying. Don't say things too loosely. What matters are the, are the properties of the, of, the, of the finite system? That controls the analysis. That tells you what monster buying causes you need. Right? We only need to banish um, indeterminism because we know that finite systems uh, in, in, in ordinary classical physics are, are not indeterministic, mostly. Okay. Now let's get on to production and emergence. Um, and this is this is some of the stuff I get. I was thinking about emerged as a, as a result of uh, came about as a result of, uh, of just thinking about what I talked to you today. So I'm going to find something uh, a little more. Uh, th there is a pretty heated debate underway in the literature over uh, over the place of phase transitions. Are they? a success of the reduction of thermodynamics by statistical physics, even in the old-fashioned naval sense, right? And there's a bunch of people who say so. You can, you can see me up there, and you can see that's Jeremy Butterfield over, uh, over there, and a whole, whole bunch of other people. And then there are others who think that it's a clear example of, of non-reductive emergence. Right now, if I said a clear example of emergence, then I could have taken the shadow image of Jeremy and stuck it on the side as well. <laughs> um, right, so, so this is the uh, this is the this is the debate that's on the way, and there's an obvious question: Who is right? <coughs> right you know, we're really going at it. We're really going at it. So, so who's right? Well, I'm very happy to tell you both are right. right? That's what I want. I think both are right, and, uh, and, and, and I'm pleased with that. And just in case you think that this is sort of backhand, no. I, I'm not going to say that anyone is more right than anyone else. Just, you know. So, so all right, what, what's the trick? What, what's the gimmick? Uh, well, the gimmick is the notion of level. You don't have reduction. You don't have emergence uh, um, just by itself. They are relations between things. Right? This emerges when we go from this to this, or we go from this level to that level. This level reduces that level. So what are the possible senses of level that we have at hand? Well, these are the ones that, that we've been dealing with. Uh, the first one is a larger one that has two parts. And I'm calling this the molecular statistical description. It's, I guess, also, also level. Uh, what, what's happening here? Well, we start out with an assumption that we're dealing with a system of very many components, typically molecules. We form a phase space whose coordinates uh, uh, come from the uh, canonical uh, positions and the mentor of the, of the components. I've drawn the other two-dimensional phase space of a harmonic oscillator. Uh, that, that, that's a very small dimension. Uh, the systems that we're considering here will typically have dimensions that will be ordering 10 to the 25, 10 to the 26. So it's a very big, complicated phase space. But you get the idea. Two dimensions, 10 to the 24. You get the idea, right? uh, defined on that phase space, uh, you will have a Hamiltonian. 
from that whole time, you, you, you get a canonical probability distribution. From that, you get the foundation function. And then from that, you crank out you know, canonical entropy, it's free energies, and all that sort of stuff. Now, within that level of description, there, there, are, there are two, two further levels that are going to end in the story. One is the level of few components. You can consider just a few molecules of water bouncing around inside uh, you know, a, a, a big glass of 10 to the 23rd um, uh, water molecules. Or you can consider the whole system. That's the, those two levels, that's the, that's the few level and that's the many level. Now there's another way of working this. That's the thermodynamic level. And it's quite different it's, you know, from the way it starts and builds up. In this case, you have a state space. Uh, I've, I've got a drawing here of a, a state space that, that has pressure and temperature along the axes. There are many state spaces that you can draw. This one is a simple one to start with. Uh, and then in that state, state space, you have thermodynamic quantities that are functions of the uh, of the states. And these include <coughs> things like volumes and temperatures and internal energies, free energies, entropy, and all that. Notice the starting points are very different: phase spaces and, and, and thermodynamic gas and state spaces. Okay, so um, I'm going to be looking at these, and to preview what's about to come, we're going to see emergence when we move from a few to many, and we're going to have reduction when we go from the whole blue box of molecular statistical. Uh, to um, uh, further and vice versa, which I'm going to prefer description of the um, uh, production. So that's what we're going on. Let's go to the, uh, to the second case first, uh, because we already talked about that one, so it's, so it's pretty easy. Uh, when I um, showed you what happens in that renormalization group analysis, I was doing the following thing. I was setting up a system that lived fully within the statistical mechanical um, well, it had many components, very, very many components, and the, you know that's what's formed by by this this space of Hamiltonians in which the renormalization group flow happens. Right? That's that is that's a that's a fully um, a statistical mechanical analysis, and from that we inferred a bunch of stuff. But some of the things that we inferred were thermodynamic relations that live in the uh, in, in, in the thermal level. Right? So it's a, it's, it's a deduction. Right? It's a not an easy one. It's complicated. But it, but it is a deduction in the end. And so what we have there is an instance of a Nagel style reduction. We're going from the lower level statistical mechanical theory, and we are inferring results in the higher level theory. Now I know there's a few complications here. Uh, the Nagel model itself uh, uh, has never really worked. You have to do things like touch it up a bit. Uh, you don't deduce the higher level theory or results in the higher level theory. You typically deduce surrogates. You know, in the lower level theory, you'll have the second law of thermodynamics. You know, at best, you can deduce that it, it, it works mostly, and then mostly becomes always in the uh, thermodynamic level. Uh, I'll set that aside. There's enough literature on that. It's, it's I think, as clear a case as, as you can get. Don't be misled by the immense complication of the calculation, that's the basis of, of, of what's going on here. Now having said that, I, I should say I know some of us think I was one of these old-fashioned reductionists. No, I, I, I'm not a reductionist in the sense that I believe that you know, everything gets produced in particle physics. Um, I mean, you know, think about the, the traffic in, in Los Angeles. Um, I do believe that the traffic in Los Angeles consists of nothing but a lot of um, a lot of uh, particles and a lot of radiation bouncing around. Uh, but I don't think for a moment that we're going to deduce facts about traffic jams right? um, uh, by, by deriving theorems in, in quantum field theory. Right? No, I, don't, I don't think that. But, but sometimes it happens, and it's happened. It's happened here. Okay. So that, that's, that's where the reduction stuff works out, where it is the uh, emergence happen. Well, the emergence, ha emergence happens when you go few, few to many, and it's crashing clear that this is, is what's going on. Uh, so here we're describing, um, uh, let, let's see if we can get uh, phase transitions I'm thinking about just a few components. I think, uh, Wayne, you circulated a little, little description earlier on. You asked the question, if I remember correctly, here's a water molecule. Is it gaseous or, or, or liquid? Right? And it's clearly an observed question. You cannot ascribe a, 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 a phase to a single molecule. 
I, I mean, that's the, that's the easiest and simplest case. And if, that, if that's all that were going on, I don't know that this would have really picked up in the literature. But, the, but there are further efforts that you can take. And so here's a, another effort to try and get phase transitions by working at what I'm still going to call the few component <coughs> work. Right? And so the standard system, the easy system that people work with, the spin lattices, the icing system, you know, where you get um, uh, molecules that can be either up or down, and there's a coupling between them. So if this guy starts wiggling, the guy next door starts wiggling. You want to know if various um, uh, macroscopic, uh, like the various larger scale structures are going to emerge that will attach to, uh, to phase transitions. Uh, what the early and mean field theory tried to do was pull off the following trick. They said, we're going to look at a few of these components, just one or two of them, and then we're going to uh, mask out all the other components surrounding it. Mm -hmm. Now, they still have an influence because these components know about the other ones nearby because there are some interactions. But we're going to mask it out by replacing them by the mean field that they produce. Right? So that gives you mean field theory. That's the that's the two-line version of mean, of mean field theory. And then you, you try and recover phase transition properties by looking at just a few spins and the way they, the way they interact with the, uh, uh, with the mean field and everything else. And that fails. It, it gives quantitatively uh, the wrong results. It, it, it just doesn't work out. And there's actually no surprise in the end when you, when you finally understand what's going on. There's no surprise that it doesn't work out because it turns out the critical phenomena, the ones that are most interesting, start playing around with phase transitions are fundamentally fluctuation phenomena. That means they're phenomena where the system is moving away from equilibrium in all sorts of wild ways. Right? And those motions, those fluctuations from equilibrium are giving you the, 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 the basic properties. So at the start, this wasn't, you know, we now realize it couldn't work because, because we're looking at averages and averages are exactly the wrong thing. So what's happening here when we move from this few component level uh, to the uh, uh, to the many component level is that a new uh, is that new phenomena observed that, uh, 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 emerging that we didn't have earlier on, and in particular we don't have the reduction model working. Right? Um, you know, you you cannot have those reductive relations that, that I that I described uh, earlier. You cannot deduce the properties of the many component system from the few. Components. So this is clearly a case of, of emergence uh, without the noble style of reduction uh, going. Now, once you, once you get sensitive to the, to the different senses, uh, you can then start to ask, well, who's talking about which? Well, let me show you a, a clear case of one of them. Um, Anderson's 1972 more is different. It's one of the starting points of the modern literature. And if you now look again at what he says, he is very clearly talking about the, uh, uh, about the second case. Um, uh, the construction of hypothesis and my parenthetical exertion, that's the ability to start the fundamental laws and reconstruct the universe. Now, Anderson again, breaks down when confronted with the twin difficulties of scale and complexity. The behavior of large and complex aggregates of elementary particles, it turns out, is not to be understood in terms of simple extrapolation of the properties of a few particles. Right. Instead, at each level of complexity, entirely new properties appear. Let me now remind you of the example that he motivates this. This is the, his argument. This is the starting example. He says, think about uh, an, an ammonia atom. It's a quantum mechanical system. Uh, an ammonia atom, one nitrogen, three hydrogen. So it has a kind of a pyramid shape. And, and it's possible for that to invert, like an umbrella turning outside of the wind. Right? Turning inside out in the, in, in the wind. And that, and that, that can happen. There's, he calls that a symmetry. He says the accessibility of the ammonia atom with, the, with its inverted state is, some, you know, it, it, it is possible. That's, that, he says, is, is a symmetry. Now, consider the same question when you're looking at a many atom system. And he talks about sugars. Uh, this is uh, fructose. Fructose is <coughs> um, uh, stereoisomers. There's a, an L type and a D type. And he points out that you can no longer get that inversion. So merely increasing the number of molecules has now broken the symmetry. And the broken symmetry is the inversion uh, phenomenon. And that's perfectly fine. I'm perfectly happy with that. But my point is all of this is happening at the molecular level. It's a fully molecular account. It's all, we, we haven't jumped to a, to, a, to a different view. We just have more, as he says, more is different. 
that's 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 exactly right. And, and I hope we all agree. Um, uh, recently he published this more is the same. That's a quirky title, but you will understand how that works. If I actually disagree with uh, um, uh, with Anderson, he says that you know the phase, phase transitions are quote, a prime example of Anderson's thesis. And phase transitions are included by Anderson, uh, just briefly uh, in his uh, analysis. Okay, so so what, what's what's going on here? Well, I I, I have a conjecture. Um, it's a dangerous conjecture because I'm now talking about people and what they tend to do. And for every every guess that you make about what people tend to do, there's always a, there's always a counterexample. But look, let me start out with just this as a as kind of a zero approximation because I really think there's something to this. Something like this is going on. Um, I think we're actually looking at what boils down to a professional divide between philosophers and, and physicists. I think that's where it's ultimately coming from. Right? Now, um, let's look at the philosophy side of this. Philosophers tend to divide things by theory. We tend to divide our knowledge by, by the theory of this and the theory of that. Uh, we're now no longer so careful about what we mean by theory, but our tradition goes back to logic, and it goes back to the idea of a theory as the deductive closure of a few aptly chosen propositions. When things go well, you know, the aptly chosen propositions are laws, right? And then we take the deductive closure of that, and bang, you have, you, you've, got, you've got the theory. So that, that's how we tend to divide things up. You know, the theory of this, the theory of that. Physicists just don't work that way, right? Um, they tend to divide things up by scale. <laughs> they tend to divide things first by the sorts of systems they work on, and then scale becomes critical in dividing the sorts of systems they work on. So there are particle physicists who work on little things, and there are cosmologists who work on very, very big things. And that's how condensed matter physicists divide themselves off. They work on stuff that, that, that obtains at a particular scale, solids, liquids, uh, condensates, and, and what have you. So, 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 so that, that's where the, the mental fences are, are, are going up. And we're putting them, you know, I, I don't want to say every philosopher does this. In fact, it might be important, but not every philosopher does this. But enough of us do that, you know, that we have offenses in different places from where the, uh, from where the physicists do. So let's then work it down here. So for the philosophers working in this old tradition, uh, the level is going to be the theory. What else would you use? Right? And, but for the physicist, the level is simply going to be the collection of processes at a particular scale. It's what we do, for the condensed matter physicist, as opposed to what you do, the particle physicist. Right? And the separation is by, uh, is by scale. So when I'm talking about reduction and emergence, as one of the philosophers on the left hand side here, I'm looking for the relations that obtain between self-contained theories. And the self-contained theories, in this case, are thermodynamics, gave you the level while they're on, and statistical physics. Uh, whereas when the physicists uh, are looking for something like emergence or reduction, they're following the natural divisions of their field. They're interested in the difference between systems of few components and systems of many components. It's their professionalization. So you can now see that there's a, a potential for a lot of mismatch here. Right? Things may well not connect up well. So let's let's see how they can how they can not, not go well together. So uh, so as a philosopher on this side. I'm not really comfortable mixing things um, from different theories in, in one level. Right? Um, if you introduce a thermodynamic property, I'm terribly bothered to know, well, well you said the entropy. Do you mean the canonical entropy, the Gibbs entropy, or do you mean the entropy defined by, you know, the, the one that lives in statistical mechanics, or do you mean the entropy defined by the Clausius formula in the instead of thermodynamics? And, and I'm kind of a bit bothered and, until you tell me which one it is, because I don't really quite know what you're talking about. Um, physicists, almost the mathematicians, are, are much less bothered by that. And they just pull in the results from whatever they need them. Right? And, you know, it's entropy, get over it, that's fine. And, you know, all right, you, you can, you can all, right, all right, be the picky philosopher and ask me those questions. Now we can now turn, now, now turn things around. Where things go, um, uh, go differently. Now, what, what about this? Um, uh, what about this few many distinction? 
Uh, I'm not really impressed by the kinetic distinction. Because remember, for me, I divide up knowledge in theories which consist of deductive closures. And when you have deductive closure, um, looking at a, at a fuse distance is, to use the term rather colloquially now, just an approximation. Right? It's not a separate level of anything. Right? It's just a rough and ready approximation for how the bigger systems might work. I, I, don't, I don't know. If I start to take that as a separate level too seriously, I am in very deep logical problems. Because if you take an approximation to be something that can enter into logical closure, right, um, then, uh, then you produce logical contradictions very quickly. Because an approximation is, is formally a negation of something you hold to be true, but it's only a little bit of negation that doesn't work. So anyway, but, but uh, yeah, of course, for a philosopher, that, that's why it's a laugh. It's, it's smoking, of course. A little bit of a negation. Well, what the hell is that? That's a negation. You've got problems. You've got a contradiction. So you know, I, I'm not taking those levels terribly seriously. But for the physicist, it's the whole damn game, right? Because it's what distinguishes the dense matter physicist from the particle physicist, from the you know, from the body that's considering just one or two components from the one who, who makes a living by thinking about it. So anyway, so, so that's my hunch. My hunch is that, that, the, that, we, the, that we have been professionalized to think in terms of different levels. And that's ultimately what's behind the, um, uh, the dispute that we've seen. And, 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 you know, and when, you, when you see that, life gets a lot simpler. Now, again, I want to emphasize not everyone's going to fall on one side or another. And in particular, if there are philosophers who are suspicious of the idea of a theory as a basic unit, philosophers like that are not going to be so comfortable with doing stuff like that. And that again might explain where, the, uh, where some of the divisions uh, go. Okay, so um, that, that's my talk. And I've maybe talked a little longer than I, than I planned, so let me remind you just very briefly of, 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 of what I said. I've introduced terminology, approximation, and idealization. Um, I've warned you of the dangers of talking about infinite systems. You know, limits don't always give you what you think they're going to give you, so uh, be careful. And then, uh, and then finally, I'm trying to get some, some kind of peace in, in this debate of production and, and, and emergence. Uh, if you'd like to read more, uh, about this, let me invite you to visit my website. You'll now, you'll now recognize these two little icons here. If you heard my talk yesterday, uh, you can download papers there and lots of, and lots of, uh, uh, of other stuff. Uh, most of the work that, uh, uh, and, and I put up this page here uh, on my website, you'll find it pretty, uh, pretty easily if you click on it. Uh, here on uh, it says lectures in that, in that top box, you'll eventually you navigate your way through that. And uh, you can get this PowerPoint. PowerPoint and links to a few papers. I'll mention two of them. Uh, one of them is this paper, which forms the, the basis of most of what I said. Approximation and idealization came out last year in philosophy of science. And in, in, and in preparation for this, this meeting, I, I just wrote another note, which has the stuff on you know, the title of the self-explanatory. Confusions over reduction and emergence in the physics of the transition. It just lays out that story about the levels and a bit of, a bit of chatter about the this system and the philosophies. That is the end. And comments, but first we have a game of our free thing. Oh, it's coming. It is that Totally brought this to do, sir. Because you're so engaged. <laughs> Systems. I was thinking of the ecosystem, biological ecosystems, mm -hmm. and uh, it, of course the universe doesn't have an infinite number of components in biology, but it has so many it might as well be. We, we we found that out when you use DDT, how the how the effects we couldn't translate all that. I was also thinking 
uh, some physicists say that uh, you have you have the, the basic laws of physics, the basic particles. So therefore, if you had a computer, I think Laplace would say that you can you can explain everything. Now the real debate is, uh, is that really true? Because uh, the emergent law, some say the emergent laws and, and true reductionism will allow you to do that. But there's no say that biology has certain properties that are different than chemistry, or biochemistry, and then they have different properties for chemistry that goes all the way down. And uh, so there's a, there's a heated debate about that, but I think your work has shown illumination on this. If you can explain that further. No, I was thinking of my job. In other words, I asked an older woman, so some people say, oh yes, we, we get the, the quantum computers, then we'll know the laws of physics. Others say, no, we'll, there will always be room for mystery. Thank you. Uh, Robert. I think Eric is next. What's that? Eric was before me. Oh. We'll probably invalidate everything I'm saying. <laughs> Anyway, uh, thanks, by the way, for a very convincing talk. Um, just to reflect on what it is that, that particularly confuses philosophers, um, one might think that it, it's not merely that we're interested in theories, it's just that we have an idea of theories and limiting case relationships and, and infinite systems uh, that that comes from mathematics, right? We, we really do think it makes sense to talk about points at infinity uh, in, in certain contexts, right? To talk about, talk about spaces in which lines meet at points at, at infinity. And uh, if we're sensible, we shouldn't be confused by that sort of talk, right? Because we're just establishing conceptual relations between different kinds of mathematical principles. And, and ideally, we should never be uh, we should never be confused into thinking that there's a similar passage between physical descriptions uh, in one element of a general conceptual framework that that deals with finite things and another element of the same very useful and clarifying framework in which one admits these infinite elements. But that seems to me to be a, a place in which in which this uh, uh, in which this emphasis on theory can and then the temptations that it that it brings with it can be made quite precise and made into a source of error. Does that sound like it comports with your idea? It sounded fine. I'm, um, I feel like I need to answer something. But I'm not, <laughs> I mean, can I can I affirm? Yes, you, you have to be very careful. Um, um, take the take the example of the of the infinite sphere. Um, I was very careful to specify the Euclidean space. I mentioned that because there are no points in the Euclidean space that are infinitely far from, you know, from some central point, let alone equidistant from them. But you're exactly right. Um, you can then go to a uh, projective geometry. You can have points of infinity. You can have the ends. A, a technique that, as, as you know very well, is um, used uh, effectively in general activity in formal diagrams and in points of infinity all the time, so that's a tricky thing. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, you, you've got to be careful. Um, uh, and you have to be wise. And, uh, <laughs> I'm neither, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, alas. Uh, but, I, but I am saying you need to be both, because mathematical precision by itself doesn't always solve all the problems. And that was one of the things I was trying to show with the mathematical approach, where you move to the literal infinity, those guys are mathematically precise. There's no question. They've, they've, they've now, I don't for a moment doubt any of, any of their theorems. I just don't, I just don't know that they're proving what they think they're proving. Because at, you know, at the very same time as they're proving results about literally infinite systems, they're claiming illumination about finite systems. The claim is plausible, but it no longer has the power of mathematical derivation that the theorem had. Does that get to me? Yeah, it's just this this kind of regarding the finite and the infinite case is part of one conceptual scheme in a mathematical context can be can be extremely clarifying in a way that it's just not going to be when we're talking about infinite versus finite physical systems. I mean, that, I, that's what I take to be a lesson of what you were saying. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Okay. I just want to make sure I got the right idea. Yeah, I didn't quite. You, you said that paying attention to the difference between finite and infinite can be extremely clarifying. Seeing, seeing them, seeing them as part of the same conceptual scheme, right? As you do in in in, uh, in projective geometry, right? talking oh, okay. about talking about points of infinity, talking about an infinite sphere, right? This this can clarify the place of one kind of geometry in a larger conceptual scheme in which you can see how these things are related, right? That's, that's certainly a possibility. Yeah, I'm, so you have in mind something like this. I'm, I'm, I'm not good on the history of 19th century geometry. The, the accounts that I read portray um, um, the driving force as the use of projective geometry as one of the ways of classifying many different geometries. And of course, projective geometry has exactly that feature that you've described, where you do include the you know, points of infinity. But projective geometry has a, has a place for where where the, the railroad tracks on the infinite plane eventually go off and lead at that, that infinite point, and that gives you a higher perspective than is certainly illuminating. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. With that. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, one a uh, somewhat friendly amendment to suggest. And the second is a question that um, I will ask about the, the distinction you make between theories and scales. So the first one, um, I don't think it's quite enough just to remark, um, as you do in your examples, uh, and I'm thinking in particular about the continuum limit example that you discussed, <laughs> that you don't get the right, you don't, that if you take the infinite limit, you don't in fact get what you naively expect. You don't actually get a continuum, you know, a true mathematical continuum from kind of limiting process that you discuss. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely true. But, there, but there's a subtlety here if you're thinking about the physics of the situation. So in fact, uh, if you talk here on the, uh, actually, uh, I'm going to talk about the, the, the crystal. Well, well when, when you were talking about the continuum limit, right? Yes, but so, I, but so, I, but I, but I so, understand the continuum limit. Yeah, I know, I know. It's all right. So, 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 so what, what was worrying you about that? Just say it again. Um, so it's correct that if you use the limiting procedure that you discuss, you will not get a true math out so I, I, I agree with that. Oh, okay, all right. So that was a uh, Yeah, that was a So I'm just waiting for the next. <laughs> you know, you, you've seen that. You know, you know what he's doing. So if you go to the... I'm trying to figure out which way to duck. <laughs> if, you go, if you go to the, um, the one-dimensional crystal. Yeah, the one-dimensional crystal. Yeah. Now, there's a very interesting limit to take here. Uh, you can take the limit as, um, uh, um, um, as the balls, so to speak, grow smaller and smaller and closer and closer together, and the strings go closer and closer together. And that's um, in, in, in an undergraduate physics course. That's, that's exactly what the procedure that they will do to derive the wave equation for one dimensional string. And I think it's actually very good. Even though technically speaking, you're absolutely wrong. I mean, you're right. You will not. You will not, in fact, get a true one dimensional continuum. You won't get the real line by by that limiting process. And the wave equation for the string is defined on the real line, not on. A numerable number of little points that are close together. But so even though you don't, but the, but the case where even though you don't get the proper limiting system by the limiting procedure, you do in fact get the correct equation of motion. Do you? Yes, you do. Have you not? Know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a serious question. Well, have you not? Know? Have you done, yeah. actually done the calculation? Um, or you just yeah. trust the textbooks? No, I, I don't trust the textbooks at all. Yeah. You, have, you have to be pretty careful because you, uh, what you have to do is, is consider your system of little balls and springs as already being embedded in the real line itself in order to justify using, in order to justify the, uh, the use of the equation to derive as a black real line. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 but I suggest you haven't been careful enough because this is a case where there's no limit. This well, is, no, is simple. No, 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 let, let me show you. Let me just go back here. What, what you've just described here, just replace that everywhere. Just take the top row and replace the guy on the left by a mass and the guy on the right by a spring. And then you have the top row is small mass, small spring, small mass. And then the top row next is yet small mass, small spring, small mass, all the way down. And you have the same failure of the limit. I, I absolutely agree. But my, my point is that, that, that even though you don't get the right system at the end, you get the right equation that you use on a different system, and a system that, in a sense, uh, is not the limit of the, pro of the process, but is the space that one, that is the uh, theater in which one performs the process. You already have one. You've given a version of my talk. 
And that's exactly what I'm saying. In this particular case, what you're going to have is a, is a limiting process such that the system has no limit. Yes. But if you track the properties, the properties stabilize out and you can the result. But, there, but uh, what I'm saying is uh, it's, not, it's a property not of. What is, what is a property of? Is a different system. One that is, it is one that is naturally associated with the, uh, with, with the, with the you're asking the question, what is it a property of? Well, let me ask you, that two here, the one right at the end, what is that a property of? I would say that is the property of the whole set of, 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 of everywhere finite systems. And so I, I would say, I mean, because it's got to attach to something that's an agent, like might take off to attach to something. But, but what you describe, mass spring, mass spring, and make it smaller, and smaller, and smaller, no, no limits. I, I agree. But you do miraculously get yeah, the right equation of motion for applying to a different system. You get the right so, two here for all of the. No, you don't get the right two. That's 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 a square root of something. No, no, no. It's the two for the for, for any finite end system. It's the right one. But so you, you don't see. Oh, that. I see. I see. I see what you're saying. And then you and then but then you do get you do get what turns out to be the right property for the uh, for the spring. Yeah. Oh, no, for the for the string. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I I I get you. Do, you but not because it's a property of the actual that's, limit. That's the correct. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, so, so my point is that, is, is that there, there seem to be cases where, uh, what, where what you're saying it doesn't, doesn't quite capture what's going on. So why do you, you know, I, I disagree. I I'm sorry. You, you've got to say this to him because he likes to say it to speakers, so I'm, I'm just, <laughs> please be assured. I won't say this to anybody else. It's just especially. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just did wrong with this. So, um, the reason this works is because a string is very well approximated by a system. A very tiny mass, very little spring, very tiny mass, very little spring. That's why it works. It's not a mystery, and it's all built into the system. What do you call the law? Let me ask you about the grease scale. Um, you, you, you have a lot of time, yeah, so, we can, so uh, why don't we take a few more questions and then come back to you. So, uh, I've got Rob Corbett's next to you. So, I, I actually want to follow up a little bit on the, this the example here, which I've seen attributed to the bay. I don't know if you've uh, seen it. So this is exactly when this kind of thing that the bay to uh, uh, advance the theories of integration. And because of the, the length property, um, I'm not going to disagree with any, any of this thing except to say that the, the last curve is actually a nice generalized curve, not a rectifiable curve. That's just that that slope in where the slope is at plus one or, or minus one. Well, the, the, the limit of the, the slope is not defined. That, yeah, you, you need to extend your alphabet function to the generalized function. Well, no way. Yeah, yeah. 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 there are lots of ways. I just wanted to add a story, oh, okay. uh, which is apropos to people who like to cross country ski around, around here, which is a very similar story. This comes from a book which has been described as the funniest mathematical textbook of all time. Uh, it's Elsie uh, Young's book uh, on calculus of variations and optimal control. And I don't know if you know the, the book. It's, it's beautiful. It's a brilliant, wonderful book. And he has a story in there about cross country skiing. Actually, skiing. It's back in the days when skiing was a, a sport for grown-ups and not a child's game of sliding down the banisters and being carried up again. <laughs> <laughs> it begins to think so. Uh, you consider it, yeah, I think you would like that. It's a, it's an infinitely smooth hill. And the, the question is to find an optimal path up to the top of the hill. And you assume that you're, you, you can't just go directly up because you slide backwards. It's assumed to be too steep to, to go straight up the ski scale. So you assume some limit for, for uh, uh, how steeply you can ski up. Maybe it's uh, five degrees, six degrees, or something like that. But because it's an infinitely smooth hill, the Euler Bromish equation is giving you a perfectly smooth, beautiful solution that spirals around the hill until you get to the place where all of a sudden you can switch and go straight to the top of the hill. Absolutely gorgeous, smooth solution. And the 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 what are the projects to have this one solution? But of course, every skier knows that you can just do herringbone straight up to the way you go. And there's a herringbone right there on your on okay. your hill. That's and, a, that's the one. And it's a much shorter solution. It's actually definitely a shorter path. You block herringbone. <laughs> 
so the property of uh, having this this uh, I mean, I just brought it up because these kinds of things that are are, are useful. It's not just that this is a medical idealization. This thing actually does have wool and engineering control and chatter controls, and they're based on general instructions. So I don't know whether you want to add that to your repertoire of stories to consider. Surely it's all part about it. The ski is all. <laughs> but I do look like that. In the, one thing that uh, uh, was puzzling me when I read the paper, uh, you say it is assumed that there is some standard of admissible inexactness for each target system, even if they. And so, so the reason why it was puzzling me is. So, uh, uh, let me try and close it. This is fairly early when I'm when I'm trying to explain what I mean by approximation <coughs> yeah. idealization. I say, yeah, okay, all right. But, so, so it's, it's oh, yeah, yeah. But here's what's bothering me, is that it seems that uh, uh, you're saying that whether there's a, an acceptable mismatch between a, 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 a description mm -hmm. and a system depends on the system. Oh, it depends on the theorist. Yeah, well, or, or on what we intend to use the representation for. It depends on the theorist. Remember, I've worked in different cultures. Uh, in, in, in physics, right? Um, uh, if you are off by 15 or 20 percent, it's a failure. Yeah. Right? You go home in shame. If you're an engineer, which is why I started out, and your, and your equation gets to, to within 15 or 20 percent, <laughs> you've won. That's it. <laughs> you have a safety factor, a factor of two, and off you go and you build a bridge. <laughs> so yeah, no, I, 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 I really there is no there is no absolute rule as to as to what the admissible standard is. It is it is defined within the particular field. I I, I expect according to uh, you know I, I haven't thought this through very carefully, but my but my hunch is that a pragmatic story is on the ground. Um, you know, how you know you know how good the the match has to be before you say this is a good approximation. You should use this one. But, um, and, and then you have the uh, the other part where you're talking about mismatch, which is the mismatch between the limiting properties and the properties of the limiting system. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if, if we don't take too seriously the assumptions that uh, describe the system, whether it's a finite or an infinite system, but that you're really just interested with. Uh, some of the thing that turns out to happen in the system, so some of the properties. Don't you have to uh, choose your set of properties that will make you decide whether you can promote an idealization, uh, an approximation to idealization in the same variable? Yeah, well, sometimes you can do the promotion, sometimes you can't. You've you just got to be careful. You know, I, 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 um, I certainly agree with that. Um, now, if there, if there is no limit system, that, in that case, then of course you, you're, out of, you're out of business. Right now. If, if there is a limit system, um, um, then yes, yeah, sometimes you can do that, sometimes you can't. Uh, notice that in the, in the cases that I'm looking at, there's such a catastrophic separation between the very large but finite system and the infinite system. You know, I, I don't think there are many promotions at hand here. Once the system has become indeterministic and is no longer conserving energy, you know, it's pretty so hard to. Say, you could say that the system exists, just not physically. Uh, you could, uh, well, if it doesn't system. exist, you could say it's well defined. Right. Yeah, no, there, there's no question it's well defined. You can describe it as possible. Well. Um, well, you, you're using existing at the same time. Yeah, okay, that's okay. <coughs> yeah, no, that, no, that's yes. a, that, there's a There's a physicist sense of existing, there's a mathematician sense of existing, there's a philosopher sense of <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. It's, uh, you've got to be very careful. These words, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a digression, but I'll go ahead. These words have to be used all the way through. The word possible, if you pay attention, right, the word possible for philosopher means something dramatically different from what it means for a physicist. For a, for a philosopher, possible means, you know, conceivable in a, in a reasonable kind of a way without any terribly bad things happening. For a physicist, it means approximately true. It's a little shocking when you realize that, that, that it's one hell of a difference. Right. Right. That was the aggression. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
just a follow-up to your conversation with Eric. I, I think it's on your side more. I mean, there's a, a relatively simple example from general relativity, the idea of local flatness, right? We think of space-time, ordinary space-times as being locally flat, meaning that it's easy to approximate the increasingly smaller regions of space-time with uh, a small coordinate system. Right? Now, in, in the limit, we, we talk about what's happening in the tangent space, right? Uh, we, we can we even say things like, well, you know, in, in the limit, as we can talk about the, at a point, you put in geometry, it's true. But of course, the idea of, of a point of space-time being flat doesn't make any sense at all, right? But in just the sense that you were saying, we have something that sort of stabilizes around a certain value as you consider, as you restrict yourself to smaller regions of space-time. We have this notion of local flatness that makes sense in a rigorous scheme, and we know not to confuse these two things, <coughs> or we hope we know not to confuse the idea of the, 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 um, the, 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 the Let me just say the obvious thing, and you know it. Uh, the Riemann curvature tensor is defined at a point if the surface is not flat. Uh, it's, but the curvature will be non-vanishing at a point. So there is a sense in which you get a solid flatness when you, um, uh, when you consider very small regions of curved surface, but you've got to be very careful how you define it. I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're triggering stuff that I did many years ago. Remember I did a paper on Einstein's principle of equivalence? Right. And one of the versions of the principle was that when you consider a very small piece of space-time, the space-time becomes Minkowskian, right, becomes flat, and Einstein objected, no, that isn't, that isn't true, that isn't true, and if you can sort of make that water for that, and he was right. But, but, you know, but that's sort of getting hit, but, but, the, but, the, but certainly in the following sentence you can say this, if we're interested in laying out street grids on the surface of the sphere, which is our, you know, our approximation of our Earth, Right, then we do lay them out by Euclidean principles. Right, and so there, there, there is going to be a sense in which Euclidean geometry is, is holding near enough in a small patch of the present surface. I'm oh, sorry, that, uh, you're, you're looking at saying, oh, you just went off the wrong direction. No, um, no, I'm just saying, you know, of course we know, we, we talk about the Riemann curvature having a value at every point, right? It's a function on vectors at that point, right? And therefore, we're talking about notions of which we've made perfectly good rigorous sense. It doesn't entirely agree with, with the intuitive sense we have of, of considering extremely small vectors. Right. <coughs> and uh, these, you know, the, the relativity textbooks that I read will always sometimes contain warnings not, not to, to forget about this difference between the discussion of what's happening on the tangent space and the discussion of what's happening actually in the space-time manifold. Yeah, yeah, we, we do have this habit of thinking of a, of a, of a vector as a, as a little, little, little interval of, I've got to find a word that hasn't been used to have a technical interval the wrong one, but as a little, as a little stretch of, of distance. Um, yeah, I know, and, 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 that, and that, that's only roughly true. But that's certainly the model, it's not a model we have. Yeah, no, th these are these are interesting issues. What happens when we do I mean, you can, you can spend a lifetime just playing around with words, but it's all, all fun stuff happens. And, uh, and they, they, they can do just such weird things. Eric, you don't mind if you refer your question to the uh, inner or, or, or whether, whether the informal part of the discussion. It's all um, thank our speaker once again.